It's good to see everybody this morning. And from the Facebook posts and pictures I've seen and the smiles on everybody's face last week, everybody had a good time. So everybody ought to be well rested. Some of us <clears throat> went traveling a little further than others, but uh, they all had to come home eventually. But it's good to see y'all this morning. Um, when you have your lessons recorded, you have a chance to go back and watch a few minutes and kind of evaluate. And I try to learn from myself. I don't watch but about a minute of me, and that's all I can take, and I have to change it. I'm one of those I can't stand watching myself. <laughs> but uh, last week, Martha was talking about um, one of her students got on her about preaching instead of teaching. And I, I'm catching myself getting into that, and I'm going to try to stop that. So I'm going to try to teach a little more this morning and use the book a little more. So <laughs> Joy said, no. Nah. <laughs> but sometimes you can't help it, boy. You just get up here and something starts flowing. You just you run with it. <laughs> and uh, I love to teach. All right. This morning, I think we got a pretty good lesson. It's lesson six. We're talking about Jesus' prayer of surrender. Um, <clears throat> all these lessons, every lesson is starting to build on itself. Every lesson is now bringing up things that we've already talked about, you know, a few weeks ago. And I think this week's a good one because there's some things brought up in this lesson that really brings out some points that we've been studying on. And let me just do the overview real quick. I'm going to try to stay in the book. And we're going to be in three different books this morning. We've got a verse in John. We're going to be in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Because they, the lesson wants you to see all three versions of the same little story. And it's all just one night. It's all explaining one event. And it breaks it down in different ways of looking at it. But this lesson calls our attention to one of the most intense private experiences in the early life of Jesus. This was his prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane on the night before his crucifixion the next morning. We're going to study Jesus' prayer of surrender to God's will as told in the gospel accounts of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. To get the full picture of Jesus' prayer in Gethsemane, it is essential to draw information from the three gospels that tell of this event in Jesus' life. And we will see what we can learn from Jesus' example, praying with a heart weighed down with sorrow, as talked about in Mark, about his approaching death on the cross as ordained by God. When Jesus was going to the garden to pray, he already knew what events was about to take place. And this was weighing on him heavily. It's the same as put yourself in that situation. Just say you know something's about to take place a year from now. Right now, it's kind of like, yeah, I know that's coming, but I got a long time between that. But as the moments tick down and as the days go by and the weeks go by, that event starts clicking in your mind a little bit heavier, don't it? You get down to about a month before time, you're like, whoa, is it already been a, almost a year by now? Like, let's just say Christmas, because guess what? You ain't got but what, five, six months? About five months before you have to cook that dinner? <laughs> See? It starts weighing on you a little more. Y'all think about two weeks before Christmas. Everybody's like, God, really? And then the night before Christmas, you're like, oh. Now, this doesn't weigh nothing near what Jesus is going through. I'm just using this as an example. This man, now I say this man because Jesus was a man while he was here on earth. As this time approached, it started nailing on him harder and harder and harder and harder. It's easy to say, yeah, I'll do something. Yeah, yeah, I'll do that for you. But then when it comes time to actually do it, you're like, man, why did I tell him I had to do that? We've all done that, right? We promise we're going to do something for somebody. Then when it comes time to do it, you're like, man, a week ago I didn't care, but right now, God, I just, but you've already made that promise. 
So you got to fulfill that promise. So this was, Jesus was about to go to the cross and he knew what was about to happen. And this was the night before. I mean, this was like right up to the moment. And this was really starting to weigh on him. And this is, this is what we're going to study today. Um, I'm going to try not to take too much time, but I figured it would be easier if I go ahead and read all three accounts real quick, if I can just read through them, and then you'll hear each account and how they're so similar, but yet they're from a different view each time, and then we can talk about them a little easier. So we'll start in Matthew chapter 26 and verse 36. Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and said unto his disciples, Sit here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and began to, sor- and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then he saith, then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. And he went a little further, and he fell on his face and prayed, saying, O my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou will. And he cometh unto the disciples and findeth them asleep. And he saith unto Peter, What, you could, could ye not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that ye, ye enter not, that enter... Let me read it right. (laughs) That ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away again the second time and prayed, saying, O my father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were very heavy. And he left them and he went away again and he prayed a third time, saying the same words. Then cometh he to his disciples and saith unto them, Sleep on now and take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going, and behold, he is at the hand that doth betray me. That was Matthew's account. Now if we look at Mark's account. I know it's going to take a minute, but I'd rather read them all now than try to break them down. And be Mark 14 and 35. It will start to verse 32. And they came to a place which is named Gethsemane, and he saith unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I shall pray. And he taketh with him Peter and James and John, and began to be sore amazed and to be very heavy. And he saith unto them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful unto death. Tarry ye here and watch. And he went forward a little and he fell on the ground and he prayed that if it were possible that the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me, nevertheless, not what I will, but thou will. And he cometh and findeth them sleeping. And he said unto Peter, Simon, sleepest thou? Couldest not thou watch one hour? Watch ye and pray, lest ye enter to temptation. The spirit is truly, the spirit truly is ready, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed and spake the same words. And he returned. He found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. Neither wist they want, they what to answer him. And he cometh the third time and saith unto them, Sleep on now, and take your rest. It is enough. The hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise up. Let us go. He that betrayeth me is at hand. That was pretty much the same. And we have now Luke. I'll read it real quick and we'll move on. Luke 22. kind of nice when you got it on there. It's really good right there. And he came out and went as he want. He came out and went as he want to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples also followed him. And when he was at the place, he said to them, pray that you enter not in temptation. Boy, they use that same one on every one of them, don't they? 
Three times is gospel, right? <laughs> pray ye, or pray that ye enter not into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's casting and kneeled down and he prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. You notice that's pretty much the same in all three. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. This wasn't mentioned in the other two, was it? This actually told of an angel. We're going to get into that in a minute, too. And being in an agony, I lost my place. And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was that were great drops of blood falling down from the ground. That wasn't mentioned before either, was it? And when he rose up from prayer and was come to his disciples, he found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said unto them, Why sleep ye? Rise and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. There's that temptation again. Three things, well, I say three things. In all three Gospels, there's only a couple things that really stood out each time in each Gospel. Number one, pray ye that ye fall not into temptation. Number two, he, Jesus just became sorrowful and agony. It's like there was a, just a weight on him. And some of the commentaries I read was as he was entering the garden and as he started praying, the weight of what he was about to do was really starting to get on him. The weight of the sins, the weight of the reason he had to be there was really starting to get on him. It didn't all happen on the cross. This started that night where he actually had to start taking on that mindset and things just started really just bearing down on him. And he's, you know, I'm going to get out of the book now. <laughs> it's already started. But, you know, it's just started weighing on him. I'm going to try not to do that. I don't think there's anything in our lives that halfway compares to anything Jesus ever went through. But it's a lesson. Yeah. You know, <laughs> that's a good point right there. And that's a good lesson for the whole day right there. Is there is nothing we can handle in life. There is nothing that we have to face in life that we can't handle because there's, always, there's already been one that's handled a whole lot more. That makes anything we go through so insignificant. I think that's what I've been trying to say. Even if it's something that we feel is just so devastating. The world is falling apart. Not the world, but your world is falling apart. But it's nothing compared to what it could be. Nothing is ever as bad as it really seems to us. Just think about it. Somebody's went through worse, and they made it. Um, that, there's a point at the very end of this, and I'm, I'm going to save it. <laughs> I don't want a spoiler alert. <laughs> and it goes along that line. All right, but let's just go through this. The Garden of Sorrow. Pray to avoid temptation. Follow his observance of the Passover with the twelve, or following his observance of the Passover with the twelve. Jesus and the eleven, when the eleven went, because Judas took off to go do what he did, okay? So Judas, Judas kind of meets up with him later, and another story to be told later. 
right? And there Jesus and his disciples went into the garden called Gethsemane. And when in Jerusalem, it was Jesus' habit to go to this location to be alone or with his disciples and pray. Jesus did nothing to avoid his betrayer in that Judas Iscariot knew of his, this location and the regularity which Jesus went there. And after arriving in the garden, Jesus said to the disciples, Pray that ye enter not into temptation. We had that lesson a few weeks ago, didn't we? And Joey's talked to me. He talked to me about it before then. This is something we all need to learn. It's something we need to follow, this example right here. With his death on the cross rapidly approaching, Jesus' concern was still for the spiritual well-being of his disciples. Jesus knew the spiritual battle in prayer he was about to enter, and he knew his disciples would be susceptible to fall into temptation. And it was not about, and it was not the disciples' strength that would enable them to avoid entering into temptation, but communion with God in prayer. It's prayer that keeps us from temptation. All right. I don't know if we're going to get into this later, but i got to go ahead and bring this out because we're here now. This has a question, but I'm going to ask you a question. What do you think this particular scripture in this particular time, it means to say, pray that you fall not into temptation? What would he be talking about? What temptation? You're the one about to go to the cross. What I mean? But he was talking about here. Number one, the temptation to go to sleep. That's the minor one. He was trying to tell them, you need to be awake. What is that talking about? Always being sober and vigilant. Remember, he's instructed before, always be sober, always be vigilant, always be paying attention, always be aware. That's talking about being aware that you don't fall into something. When somebody's communicating, when you're trying to talk you into something, you need to be vigilant and aware of what this person's doing so you don't fall into that temptation to fall into what they're trying to talk you into. But this is talking about also, which one was it? Peter was always right there with Jesus. I'll love you, Jesus. I'll go to the ends of the earth with you, Jesus. I'll never forsake you, Jesus. You are my everything, Jesus. Nothing, I mean, I love you. What happened? The cock, the cock shall not throw crow three times before you deny him three times. Do not fall into temptation. When Jesus was taken captivity, the first thing all of them did was scatter like roaches. That was what Jesus was trying to talk about. We can talk big all we want to, but when the moment comes, there's always that temptation, that fight or flight. Am I going to stay and face this thing or am I going to run? And that's what he was trying to tell him. You need to pray to be strong. That when all this happens, that you're strong enough to stand here and face this. That's what Jesus had to be. Because you notice in the prayer, I know I'm getting off. Notice in the prayer, the first thing Jesus said was, Lord, or he said, Father, if you'll let me. I know I told you I'd do this. But if you'll let me, please, find another way. Let this cup pass for me. But if it has to be done, I'm willing to do it. Man, that's a hard, that's just, un, that's hard for a human mind like ours to fathom something like that. right so when you're not sleeping or doing something else you need to be in a time of prayer because you never know what you're about to face 
That's us talking about being in constant prayer. The Bible talks about that, forever being in prayer, constantly, all the time. Keep an open line. If you're not thinking about nothing else, think about him for a minute. Keep that going because that constant communion, like it talked about here, but it's the communion with God in prayer that keeps you out of temptation. Before you make a decision, pray about it. Don't ever make snap decisions. That's in business, personal life, anything. It's always if somebody asks you something, step back a minute. Sometimes I've gotten myself in a lot of trouble. Somebody says, you want to da da da? Yeah, sure. And they're like, oh, man, should have done that. But you've already committed, right? Sometimes you need to step back, especially in a business deal. You better step back and say, well, think about that in a minute. Especially in personal life. If somebody asks you something or something's coming up, you better sit there and pray about it. Because something seems good now. Tomorrow, after you've thought about it a little while, you're like, yeah, it probably wasn't a good idea. I see a lot of heads going, you know, we've all been there. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Everything's all fun and games while everybody's around slapping each other on the back going, yeah, yeah, man. Everything's good. And then you get home, and you're like, oh, man. We've all been there. That's what he's talking about. Pray that you fall not into temptation. It's tempting to go along with the crowd and to do what feels good at the moment. Moments pass. Things change. Minute by minute. Okay? All right. Jesus' soul was in anguish. The Matthew version, chapter 26 after instructing, the, after instructing the eleven to pray, Jesus removed himself from them to a private place of prayer, and he took with him part of the way, Peter, James, and John, but he also separated himself from them a short distance to pray alone. Matthew records the state of Jesus' soul at this moment, noting it was sorrowful and very heavy. It was a revelation Jesus made known to Peter, James, and John. So intense was Jesus' sorrow, he described it as, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Jesus said this himself. Jesus' overwhelming sense of dread had more to do with his sin-bearing sacrifice of himself on the cross and his experience of separation from the Father than with the physical punishment he was to suffer, although that too was a horrible part of his agony. Feeling anguish, feeling the anguish of his soul, Jesus said to Peter, James, and John, Tarry ye here and watch with me. And Jesus desired them to pray with him for the strength he needed to bear his sorrow and the burden of his commitment to die on the cross to fulfill God's word. That is real good. Can you imagine that? I know a lot of us here are close to our parents or close to someone that's always been there for them. And then at some point, that person has to let you do something. They have to let you go for a minute. And then there's a separation anxiety there. Jesus knew that the Father loved him and would do anything in the world for him. They were one. But God had to turn his back on Jesus for a moment and let something happen. And that, I believe, hurt Jesus a lot more than the physical pain. There's a lot more mental things that can happen to a person and yourself that you go through that's a lot worse than a physical pain. A physical pain, you'll get over. Bones heal, wounds heal, you get over things. It's hard to get over some things that happen up here. It is a hard thing to do. I never intended to go down this road, but here we are. But it is hard. There's things that I'm sure if I, I'm no different from anybody else in here, and I always use myself, and I know I do, but it's just I can talk about myself because I don't know y'all quite well enough yet to talk about y'all. So, <laughs> I wouldn't talk about you bad. <laughs> 
But there's things that, you know, I experienced early on in life, a long time ago, that I'll still deal with now. Some good, some bad. But you eventually have to get over it, and you have to learn from it, and then just move on. But there's things you'll deal with up here. And this is the things that Jesus was having to deal with. He went from being the beloved, the one and only, I am the child of God, literally, to, nope. Yeah. It's actually mentioned in here, and I was hoping I can get to it before I said it. We're going to read it in a minute. I don't want to spoil it. <laughs> but that's a good point. Let me ask you this question. Jesus' prayer in Gethsemane could be called his crucifixion in effect before his crucifixion in fact. Why was this so, and why was it necessary? Why do you feel it necessary that Jesus went through the mental agony as much as he did the physical agony? Have you ever been so burdened with care and sorrow over the same challenge you were facing and you found it difficult to pray? How did you overcome this and what was the outcome? That's something to think about. Two principles regarding the prayer are often lacking among Christians. The first is that of being honest enough to admit to our brothers and sisters in Christ that we are hurting and we need their prayerful support. Just like Jesus needed his disciples' support at this time. He was almost begging for it. He was like, I need y'all to pray with me. He was seeking support. Jesus exemplified this by asking his disciples to pray with him as he prayed for himself. The second is that of being Christians, being prepared to come alongside those who are hurting to minister to them. We might like to avoid suffering our own and others, but if we are the body of Christ, when one suffers, all of us suffer. We should see it not only as our duty, but more as our privilege to minister in prayer on our Lord's behalf to those who are hurting. If we see somebody that's hurting, it should be our immediate response to pray for that person. Not be asleep, not let it go, say that's not my problem. It is your problem. If you see a brother and sister in need, what does the Bible say? If you see something that you need to do and you don't do it, that also is a sin. If you see a brother or sister hurting or you see him going through something, it ain't like you got to go to them and explain it or help them that way, but you can be in prayer for them. That person don't even have to know you're praying for them because a lot of prayers that are answered are done in secret, right? When you get alone somewhere and you get serious with God about something for somebody, that's when things happen. Amen? Is this okay with everybody? Are we doing good? Okay. Submission to the Father. After encouraging the disciples to give themselves to prayer, to resist temptation and pray with him, Jesus dis distanced himself from the followers about a stone's cast and knelt on the ground and began to pray. Matthew and Mo Mark and Matthew both mentioned that Jesus fell to the ground, while Matthew adds that he fell on his face and began to pray. Matthew, often prayer was done standing up with his eyes filled, lifted to heaven. However, the intensity of the situation Jesus was facing drove him to his knees. According to Mark and to Matthew, it seems Jesus eventually became prostrate on the ground as he prayed. Jesus' prayer was focused on the possibility that the cup of suffering that lay ahead of him might be removed. All right, the cup was representative of the wrath in the Old Testament. This cup of wrath, God's righteous judgment against sinners, had to be drunk by Jesus. So believers in Jesus 
for salvation would not have to drink it. He knew he was about to take on something that he didn't want us to have to do. Lost my place. Jesus accepted the penalty for our sins so that we who trust in him do not have to receive that penalty. And Jesus knew the Father could remove the cup from him if that were his will. But God's will was for Jesus to drink this cup and he willingly surrendered himself to the Father's will to save sinners by the way of the cross. Even though this meant a lot to him, or it, I say it meant a lot to him, even though Jesus knew what he was about to go through, he was willing to do that so that we wouldn't have to. When people get a hold of that idea, it might help them make that decision just a little bit better. When you realize what somebody did for you, if somebody does something for you, similar like you know, somebody really goes out of their way to do something for you, it raises your respect for that person just a little bit higher, don't it? I believe if this world truly understood who Jesus was and what he did for them, I believe it would change a lot of people's attitude towards it. I believe that's our job. As a Christian, we need to be letting others know what this means that we have. It's not just a simple prayer that we did. It's not just a changing of our mind and our attitudes. There's a powerful thing that happened so that we can have what we have. It's so, it's so big, it's how I'm having a hard time explaining it. When you grasp a hold of that, I think we've all in here grasped a hold of that. Somebody did something so great for us that we should respond in kind. Does that make any sense whatsoever? It's mind-blowing when you start thinking about God, when you start thinking about how big he is and how massive his grace is and his mercy and what Jesus did to keep us from having to do things. We are spoiled. Amen? Is anybody in here willing to admit that we are spoiled? Before that veil ripped in the temple, people had to go through way more than what we have to go through just to be forgiven of a sin. There wasn't no you want to come down to the altar or you want to just sit in your pew and pray. There was things you had to do. It was not easy. But now it's so easy when you realize Jesus is the one and only begotten Son of the Father. No one loves you more than Him because He went to the cross and He died for you. He took on all that pain, all that suffering, and all that sin that you had. And he went to the cross with it. And he made a way. He made that sacrifice that we don't have to do that. That now all we have to do is he's sitting on the right hand of the Father making an intercessory prayer for us. That all we have to do is say, forgive me. I have sinned. That is so easy. He made that way right here in the Garden of Gethsemane. That's the example we need to have. Sometimes we can be that person, and I didn't think about this till just now it hit me. We can be that person to somebody else. We know somebody's about to go through something. We can be that person praying in the Garden of Gethsemane for that person in that situation. And you may sit there and say, God, I don't want to do that. God, I don't want to do that. But your will has to be done. And because of your obedience in doing what you didn't want to do, you saved another person from whatever it is they're going through. I felt that. So it's not always what we want. We want to help somebody by just throwing a little cash at them, hugging their neck, saying it's okay. And there's things we don't want to do. 
But it's not our will, it's his will. Amen? And it's hard, but sometimes it's really hard. Sometimes we have to turn our back on some people. God didn't want to do that to Jesus, but it had to be done. Thy will be done. Amen? Encouragement to watch and pray after some time. Lord, we're right there at the end. He encouraged them to pray. He encouraged them not to fall asleep. Amen? We're right here at the end, y'all. Whether you want to believe it or not, we're right here at the end. Now is not the time to fall asleep. Now is not the time to fall into temptation. The temptation to want to go away for a minute. The temptation to want to go to sleep. Now's the time we got to be of good courage and be strong. Amen? There's things coming. I'm trying to skip ahead so we don't... But the hour has come. Where are we at? All right, here's the point I wanted to make earlier. We should all learn from Jesus' prayer in Gethsemane that when we commit to do God's will regardless of of how difficult that may be for us. It is best for us. In Gethsemane, Jesus prayed to God who was able to save him from death and was heard. How do we know God heard Jesus? Because one, he did what he said he was going to do. Number two, didn't he send an angel? Remember what was in Luke's account? We know Jesus' prayer was being heard by God because an angel was dispatched to Jesus at that moment to say, I, I'm no, I'm here. You're okay. Amen? Angels don't just go around and miss saying, you all right? They're not like waiters just coming table to table saying, you good, you good, you good, you good. When an angel shows up, they're there for a reason. Amen? You say an angel showed up to me and you say, well, he was there for a reason. That's how we know that prayer was heard. That's how we know it wasn't wasted time. Jesus' prayer that began with a question about the possibility of his avoiding death became by his submission to God's will. The prayer answered by Jesus' resurrection from the dead. For him and for us, it was infinitely better for Jesus to be saved from death by resurrection than to be saved from death by avoiding it. I underline that. That is so awesome right there. Choosing to do God's will always results in what is best for us. If Jesus had been saved from that death in the garden, we'd have still been hung out to dry right now. And that's a hard way of saying that, but it's the truth. If he hadn't have done that, if, he'd, if God had said, okay, we'll find another way, who knows if he'd have found another way? And we'd still be sacrificing, and we'd still be on the hook for our sins. But it was best for us, and it was best for everybody that he was saved from death by the resurrection. Did y'all get that point? We are saved from death by our resurrection, <laughs> either from death or from the great calling away. You say, what do you mean death? We're safe in death because we've already said to be absent from the body is to be present from Christ. What if he hadn't have done that? It would have all been different. Man, it just, I don't know how to bring that out anymore. Does everybody understand that? Sometimes we have to go through things and we're right there. Sometimes we do have to go through things. And sometimes we do have to do things for others we really don't want to do. But sometimes it's God's will that we do it. And it may be tough going through that. It was tough for Jesus to go through what he did. But look at the outcome. Look at the outcome. Look at the long game. Sometimes we want to play the short game, the here and now. 
Sometimes it ain't all about instant gratification. Sometimes it ain't all about the right now answer. It's about the answer that's coming. Amen? I hope that... Go ahead. You know, when Jesus did what he did, it made him a stronger person. It made a stronger witness. And if it was easy for Jesus, we probably wouldn't have done, it probably wouldn't have meant as much to us. If something's easy to do, we look at it and go, ah, that wasn't a big deal. But it's because of the agony he went through makes it all that much more special what he did. Sometimes when we go through something, it makes us stronger. When we do those things we don't want to do, it makes us stronger, and it makes what we do that much more special for that person and for you. That's right. All right, any questions or comments? Anybody want to bring something out? This is your class. You're free to speak. Okay? I hope this came across good this morning. I tried to not just preach to you. I wanted to teach a little this morning. So I hope you got something out of this this morning. But let's all be Christ's example and be willing to do for others because the Bible says do unto others as you would have done unto yourself, right? You will want somebody to do things for you. Sometimes you got to do some things and do some things and then things come back. Amen? So let's, let's don't be scared to do what God puts in our heart to do for somebody because you never know what that outcome is and the outcome is worth what you had to go through to get there amen all right father i want to thank you this morning thank you for your word thank you for the ability to be able to come into your house this morning and to learn more about what your son jesus did for us and jesus we want to thank you so much there's no way that we can repay everything that you did for us Everything that night in the garden, Lord, everything that happened on the cross, everything that went through just so we can stand here and praise your name and praise our God and say thank you and to give us eternal life, Lord. Lord, help us to go out and be that witness and be able to do for others as we would, as you would have done. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.